And here we go. Jason Grimsley is here. Let's get him on the phone. Jason, what's going Hello? on? Welcome on Over the Top Sports. No, thanks for having me. Well, thank you for uh, for joining us. And, uh, I mean, let's get right into it. We're, uh, you know, Yankee fans here. So, talking to you, got to bring up 1999, 2000, the World Series uh, runs. Um, just the teams that you were on. I was, I was going over the rosters again today, Jason. And, uh, first of all, the teams were loaded with talent. And, and second of all, uh, you know, playing for Joe Torre, and uh, can you just speak to that, winning a World Series, the emotion? I mean, you pitched uh, 1999 against Atlanta in the World Series, just uh, the feeling that you must have had being on the mound against them. Oh, yeah, it's, it's sort of like your debut. It's sort of indescribable. I wish I could take my head off and let everybody feel it because it it's something else. You know, and yeah. then, like, like you said, playing for Joe Torre and, you know, the, the talent we had on that team, you know, the difference between – that team and other teams that I've been on, you know, there's there's talent pretty much everywhere, but everybody everybody on the same side manager? of the rope there. Excuse me? Would you say Joe Toy was your favorite manager you played with? He's one of them. He's right up, he's right up there. But Who's uh, the other guy? Oh, it's got to be Charlie Manuel. Hey, you got two great ones. You really can't go wrong with either of them, that's for sure. Yeah, <laughs> no, but, uh, you know, you mentioned the talent on that team. The thing that impressed me about the, those teams were – the, the 25 guys that were all pulling on the same side of the rope, you know, there was never any strife in the clubhouse. Everybody knew their jobs, what they had to do. And it was just go out there and win. Right. And uh, I even read that, uh, you know, you were Bernie Williams' locker mate. And, <laughs> I mean, just um, can you speak to Bernie, uh, you know, being as Yankee fans, you know, sharing a locker with him and, uh, you know, Jeter, you know, I mean, through those years, Derek Jeter, uh, you know, what he's meant to us as Yankee fans, just uh, can you speak to them for a little yeah, Bernie, you know, I couldn't have had a better guy sitting next to me. Probably one of the nicest guys I've ever met in, in baseball or anywhere for that matter. Soft-spoken, just never heard him have a bad thing to say about hardly anything. Uh, it's just a stand-up, just just a good human being. You know, and then you got, you got Derek Jeter, who was – you knew he was the captain of the Yankees when you walked in that clubhouse and you walked on that field. He was, he was definitely a leader, you know, and you and at a young age, you could see that when I was – when I was with other teams playing against him, and then when I was, I was on other teams after playing the Yankees playing against me, you, you knew who the captain of the Yankees were. Uh, yeah, Derek Jeter is definitely the captain over there. We have a we heard a very very interesting story about you that a lot of people don't really know that you did, and we want to hear you talk about it. In 1994, uh, with Albert Bell's cork bat, and you going through the air conditioned duct and replacing it with a clean bat. Can you take us back over there? Because I think this is one of the most funniest stories I've ever heard in my life, and I condone you as a great teammate for doing such. <laughs> uh, can you take us into what was going on? How'd that happen? Who put you up to it? Yeah, well, it, 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 it started out real, you know, just as I'd happened to walk in the, the stadium that day at Comiskey with the umpires, and I was I was talking with one of them, and I just happenstance noticed that their, their locker room was on our side, and I didn't really pay attention to it. And, uh, I'm sitting on the bench next to Buddy Bell when the game starts, and Albert comes up for his first at bat, and they take the bat, and I look over, and Mike Hargrove's got his head hanging down. And I asked Buddy, I said, Buddy, what's wrong with Grover? He looks at me and says, we're done. I said, what do you mean we're done? He said, he's getting suspended for 10 days. He's got bats <laughs> used to. I said, I looked at Buddy, and I said, Buddy, I think I can get that bat. He said, well, what do you mean? I said, well, they're on our side, and I know it's a false ceiling. I bet you I can get over and get that bat. And so next thing you know, I'm in the – I'm up in the roof crawling through <laughs> crawling through the rafters to go get the bat. The the funny part about it was I got I got to where I thought the room, the room was and I picked up a towel and it was the grounds crew guys. And one of them looked up at me and I'm talking looked right at me and all I did was give him the be quiet sign. He just gave me an okay sign. Dude never said nothing about nothing. <laughs> that is no, being a that, great um why Paul Sorrento's bat though? Was it uh, was that the closest thing that you had to Albert Bell's, or why not an Albert another Albert Bell bat? Were they all cork? They were all cork. <laughs> <laughs> how how long do you think he got away with it before um, like using the cork bats until he got confiscated? I don't know. Albert didn't. He didn't. That's the funny thing was he didn't need them. That was probably one of the strong stronger guys with the best bat speed I've probably ever seen. Yeah, there was a nine year span there where there wasn't anybody any better than that guy. You know, it's uh, you know, and the reason we use a Paul Sereno bat was because it looked like an Albert Bell bat. That's the only reason. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, I mean that's uh, when we uh, were reading up on that story. That we all said that's the greatest thing that we've heard uh, in sports. We actually uh, wanted to play the Mission Impossible theme while you were talking, but we didn't <laughs> want to throw you off. <laughs> yeah, I guess. Yeah, I guess you got to do a, a special one. When uh, I forgot who came down here, I think it might have been Fox or somebody came down and talked to me about it, and they set up rafters and everything in the room and put put a black tarp behind it and looked like I was actually in the ceiling doing the interview, which I thought was sort of funny. <laughs> and uh, we walk we walked through that whole situation. It was, you know, like I said, it was talk about adrenaline. I got adrenaline when I was pitching, but dropping into that umpire's room that was probably some of the most adrenaline I've ever had. <laughs> and uh, I read that uh, Major League Baseball even threatened to get the FBI involved. Did you buy that at all? Were you nervous, or were you just like, I mean, it's a court <laughs> bet. The FBI is not getting involved. <laughs> yeah, no, I wasn't worried about anything. <laughs> um. Uh, listen, as a talking today's game, as a pitcher, uh, what do you think of this week? They were coming up, but they wanted to put a uh, a clock up there and time the pitchers. Uh, you think that's ridiculous? I think you know <clears throat> everything with the you know the instant replay, uh, the not being able to pitch inside, um, you know, not being able to take somebody out second base or you know catcher can't block home plate. You know, the, you know the game's changed. And funny thing is, when I was a rookie coming up, you know, we had Bobby in the air, Von Hayes, Mike Schmidt all these different guys, and they would talk about how much the games had changed since they were in the league. You know, they couldn't believe it was changing like it was changing. And I can I can see what they're saying. And, you know, there's guys that are playing now that towards the end of their career that are talking to guys that are just coming up saying, hey, the game's changed. You know, and it's, it has. It evolves. It changes. You know, I don't think I couldn't – I don't know if I could pitch today because I had a tendency of throwing inside a lot. You know, and you come close to hitting nowadays to get warned. Now, you can't look at any Hall of Fame ballots without the steroid rise coming up about it. Um, you've been a little about outspoken about the steroids thing. Do you think these guys should be able to get in, especially guys of calibers of like Barry Bonds and Roger Clemens, who have probably the best pitching and uh, hitting numbers of all time, you could even argue. What do you think? Of, uh, what's your take on the steroid stance of the Hall of Fame? Yeah, well, you that, still got to the ball to play, get people out, you know, and you still got to hit the ball. You know, there's nothing you can take that's going to – give you the ability to pitch or give you the ability to hit something, you know, that's, that's, that's an opinion. You know, there's, there's people that could argue with that, but, uh, you know, the thing, the thing that it did make, give you, give you the ability to do was, was heal a whole lot quicker and be able to stay in the weight room longer and get stronger, you know, and they must, you're, 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 you're a racehorse, you know, and they pay you to race and when you can't race no more, they don't care about you. I do yeah, know that. And, um, <laughs> during that time, it was, it was no penalty for it for most of these guys. So why wouldn't you do that to get the upper hand and make some more money on your contract years, you know? A lot of people are doing it, yeah. so why should this guy get the upper hand instead of me? Yeah, well, I, I, I agree with that sort of. <laughs> you know, um, it was, it was, it was, it was, it was an era. You know, it was a time. You know, and I don't know what was done before we got there. And you know, and I, I know what's, what I don't know what they're doing after I, after I left. But you know, during that period, that period of time, you know, I'm pretty sure there's a lot of guys that were. Um, you know, you uh, have admitted to, to taking HGH, uh, especially after the surgery, uh, the Tommy John that you had, uh, you know, just try to, to hang on to the game a little bit more. Um, how easy was it to get HGH, uh, you know, during your career? Uh, I read that it was called beanies and it was very, uh, you know, it was something that was very uh, talked about, uh, even just in a clubhouse, talked about in the open. Is that something that you would agree with or was it something that, uh, you know, we didn't talk no. about Anybody did, they did. No, those are those are those are two two totally separate things. Uh, you know, the HGH, you, you could you could get it was you know it's not a schedule three. It's just something you can get from a doctor. They write your prescription, you get it, or you you can buy it from people that have it. You know, it was it was easy to get. Now the beans is basically just amphetamines. You know, and those were taken for a long time before I got there, and they were taken a little while after. But you know, that was. Uh, that was something that had been done probably since the fifties when they had something called like it's called red juice back then. But, you know, that was something that was around baseball for a long, long time. Um, and then your career uh, obviously ended pretty abruptly. Uh, June 6, 2006, uh, the FBI shows up at your house. Um, did you have any idea that they were coming to the house? Uh, had you heard any sort of rumors or were you caught completely off guard? No, uh, the, when they when they came initially, I was. But the second time they come in, when everything hit the news, and I, I knew I knew what was going on. But uh, uh, you know that was that was that was something that was unfortunate. You know, like you said, I was I got caught in a, basically a trap. 
I was right. I was trying to hang on. I was like I was trying to hang on because uh, you know when it's when it's when you've done it for that long in your life, you want to you want to keep doing it as long as you possibly can. Right. Yeah. Um, I I get it. And I, I listen. I did a little research on you. I like to read up as much as possible on any guests that we have on. And I read a lot that uh, you didn't want to do interviews right after, and uh, your family felt that uh, the media was portraying you wrong, and you had book offers and. Um, you know, why even, you know, first of all, thank you for coming on our show. But secondly, um, you know, has your stance changed on that? Uh, you know, do you feel that you were wronged by the media or, uh, you know, just speak on that for a few minutes? Well, you know, I don't, I just, I don't think they had the, the entire story. They didn't have, they didn't have a whole lot of it, right? There was a whole lot of speculation going on, you know, and they, I know everybody in the media is sensational themselves and they got a job to do to get stories out to their viewers and their the people that are reading whatever they're writing, you know, they, they got a couple hearsay things and just ran with it, you know, and it was it was it wrong? Yeah. A lot of it was factually wrong, but, uh, you know, it, it is what it is. And it was what it was. You know, I just didn't want to put my family through anything like that. That was the reason I didn't do interviews or would, did not do a book deal. Didn't want to subject them to, you know, having, having my life tore apart again or anything, you know, happened to them. Middle relievers in today's baseball are huge, especially with that 100 pitch count going on. You see the New York Yankees, they, they're they trying to shorten games one inning at a time with these pitchers. Who would you say your favorite pitcher is today, and how do you feel the games change from your time pitching in the middle relief and today's? Uh, Justin Verlander, by far. <laughs> he's, still, <laughs> he's, he's still doing it at an extremely high level. Yeah, he's you know, watch, that, watch, watch that man go out there and, and, and pitch the way he does year in, year out. You know, it's almost like he's got a different gear than the playoffs. You know, he's just a different animal later in the season. And um, just the consistency of the, the, which that guy, he starts he starts a game at one speed, and by the end of the game, he's throwing harder, he's breaking ball sharper. It's He's, he's just an amazing athlete. Uh, and Jason Grimsley, uh, we're talking to Jason Grimsley for anyone just joining us. Uh, Jason, again, thank you. Uh, I know you're associated with the uh, Bandidos baseball in Tomball, Texas. Uh, I looked it up and uh, listen, the first thing I saw was the motto, which I thought was awesome considering everybody getting a participation trophy these days. Uh, if you hit, you don't sit. And uh, to me, that is awesome. And uh, can you just speak on this for a little bit, what you're associated in? And just uh, some alumni that I saw, which is awesome. Paul Goldschmidt, Jameson Tyon, and uh, yesterday's uh, hero for the Patriots, Danny, uh, Danny Amendola. Yeah, there's some big names there. You know, and uh, the guy that, that is the Bandito is Ray DeLeon. He, he, he puts more kids in college than probably anybody in the country as far as when it comes like that. You know, and the job he does with those kids uh, – from the time, from a really young age, getting them all the way through high school, getting them into college, and um, you know even, even beyond, you know it's it's amazing what he does, and he's done it he's done it for so long. You know he's got, he might have got a little bit of, bit of a bad rap here and there. He might be too hard on the kids, but I just think he goes out and he, he does one thing he wants to do. He wants to put the best product that he can on the field. He wants to win, and he wants to all those kids, every kid that plays in, in his organization, get a college scholarship. That's his goals. Now, I know it's not your sport, but it's obviously a big deal here. The Super Bowl is coming up. We have the Patriots and the Eagles coming in there. I know you uh, might have boycotted the NFL. Are you still on that boycott? Yeah. Yeah, well, I might watch the Super Bowl. I'm not sure, but, you know, that's – I'm the first generation of my family that's not military. And, you know, that flag means a whole lot to me and my family. And, uh, and we – we support that 100%. Yeah, we you? agree with you uh, <laughs> completely. So. I, I didn't stop watching the game, although I couldn't do that. But I agree with everything going on. Do you want to elaborate what bothers you so much about all that? You know, it's you know everybody's everybody, they have their cause, you know, and I, under, I understand the cause. But uh, I don't think that's a setting in which to uh, to get that that out in the forefront when you're when you're basically taking a knee during the flag that covers you that gave you the right to do what you're doing on that field and basically, you know, gave you a, a free country to live in and the freedom to express whatever you want to express, you know, and that, you know, it's sort of a catch-22 right there. You know, you got freedom of expression, which is a gift because there's a whole lot of countries that don't, you know, that, that they're, they're free to express themselves any way they want. And I'm also free to express myself and not watching the NFL football. Thank you for doing so. Yeah, uh, we completely agree with you. And uh, I actually personally ordered a uh, Alejandro Villanueva jersey uh, after that game took place, and he was out oh, there yeah. by himself. So, yep. uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Jason. 
Yeah, no doubt about that. You know, that was talk about somebody taking a stand. Exactly. Was... Absolutely. Uh, I just want to thank you again for joining us. Thank you for your time. Uh, everybody can check out banditosbaseballclub.com just to hear uh, and read up more about what Jason was saying. I looked at it. Seems like an awesome program. The alumni there uh, is off the charts. Uh, I had no idea. Paul Goldschmidt, uh, you know, coming out of that program is unbelievable. Jason, thank you again. And uh, hopefully we can talk to you again as uh, baseball season uh, approaches and we get into it and, uh, and pick your brain on uh, some baseball. Yeah, I'd love to. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Jason. Thanks a lot. All right, everybody. That was Jason Grimsley, ex-middle uh, reliever in Major League Baseball. He won two World Series with the New York Yankees. That was a fun interview. It was a pleasure for him coming on.